Well, good morning. Good morning. It's an honor to be with you here in Holland, and uh, I just want to begin by thanking you for your investment in helping congregations all across this region, all across this country, be places where people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families are known and are needed, uh, where they are invited and embraced, and where they're not only served, but they're the ones who are doing the serving. And for those of you who are working within the service system, I just wanted to thank you for your commitment to helping people flourish in all areas of their life, educationally, vocationally, relationally, but also uh, spiritually. So my talk today is going to be on the topic of belonging. It's something we've talked about uh, year after year at this uh, Summer Institute uh, of what it means to be truly belong to a community. And I want to share what we're learning from young people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in their families about what it might look like to be a community that is really marked by that belonging. And so to start you off, I just want you to begin to think about this. Have you ever thought about what it is that makes you feel like you really belong somewhere? about the things that really help you make you feel like you're part of some place or a particular community. If you took just a moment and reflected on maybe the faith community that you're part of, what would you point to that tells you that you really belong there? Well, in my own field of education, the outcomes that we have pursued for young people with labels like Down syndrome and autism and intellectual disability, they've certainly changed over the years. We began talking about pursuing integration, and now most of our conversations really talk about pursuing inclusion. But my sense is that both of those terms really fall short of what really matters most. People want to be more than integrated and more than included. They want to experience true belonging. But that's a hard concept to define, isn't it? Uh, and I suppose that's probably true of most of the things that matter most. Uh, they're easy to talk about, but really hard to pinpoint. And I think belonging is one of those things that we can really recognize quickly by its absence because it's deeply felt, but it's much more hard for us to describe its presence. So what would be markers of belonging for people with disabilities and their families and their communities of faith? Well, as part of a multi-year project focused on faith and flourishing, we've uh, been sort of in conversation with over 500 families of young people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And we interviewed 50 of those young people and their families about their faith and about the things that really helped them to thrive in, in their lives. And some of the questions that we asked really focused on their attitudes and those actions and experiences that, that made them feel like they really belonged in their faith community. And from those conversations emerged 10 dimensions of belonging. And that's what I want to share with you in my time this morning. And as I do, I hope that you'll see that belonging turns out to be much more of posture than about place. And it's fostered much more through relationships than programs. And I think you'll see it requires ordinary gestures much more than extraordinary responses. Belonging, as was described by these individuals and their families, was marked by this trajectory of deepening relationships. And I'll put on your screen the markers that those uh, identified for those families, and I'll read them. They indicated that belonging was felt when they were present, when they were invited, when they were known, accepted, supported, when they were cared for, befriended, needed, and loved. And while I, I'm sure those dimensions aren't exhaustive, there may, may be others, in fact, that will be part of our conversation this afternoon, nor are they universal, uh, they can serve as helpful points of reflection for congregations that are committed to becoming more inclusive of people with disabilities. So I'm going to walk through each of these, and I hope that you'll be struck by, first, how ordinary they are, second, how well within your capacity they are to address and also what a difference it can make if we invest in these 10 places. So let's start with presence. Because belonging begins with presence, and in many congregations, the principal barrier to belonging may simply be the absence of people with disabilities in their families, from worship and learning and service and social activities, all the things that make up congregational life. You can't have a presence if you're not present, and it's hard to feel like you're part of a community from the outside. And yet most of the available metrics that I'm familiar with suggest that ministry apart from people with disabilities may be the most dominant ministry model across this country. So think about just a sampling of statistics. And I apologize for those of you who uh, didn't realize I was a researcher and I was going to throw some statistics up. But <laughs> I feel obligated. Uh, 
More than half of all adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities who are receiving formal services in our country have not been part of a religious service or any kind of spiritual practice at all in the prior month. More than half of parents tell us that they've reported keeping their child with disabilities from participating in religious activities because support was not provided. More than two-thirds of teenagers do not attend any kind of youth group or small group. More than one-third of parents have reported changing their place of worship because their son or daughter was not welcomed or included. And fewer than one out of every five congregations uh, are said to offer any kind of support to children with developmental disabilities in their religious education programs or to host support groups for families or offer any kind of respite opportunities. What's standing in the way of people being present in the faith community of their choice? Well, there's certainly barriers of awareness and attitude and access. Those are things that we'll be talking about that abound in our congregations, just as they do elsewhere in society. And that also includes architectural barriers. In fact, I think uh, I've shown you this picture. A few years ago at the Summer Institute, I put forward this congregation as the most inaccessible one in the world. Um, <laughs> It is a church that's built into the side of a large granite mountain with uh, hundreds and hundreds of steps up to it, right? So that prevents presence, certainly. But I was wrong. Um, <laughs> it turns out there are other congregations that have literally taken an accessibility to new heights. This is a picture of a church in Italy on the top of a mountain, um, must be several hundred feet high. And then someone sent me this one, which is actually a monastery where one monk lives um, in Georgia, I believe. It's at the top of a granite structure, uh, but you'll notice there is an elevator kind of somehow on the side, right? These pictures always get a chuckle like they did here, but subtler barriers send that very same message. What does your buildings communicate about your theology? What is that one step? say to someone about who, who you think about lives in your community? Um, and where, does where you gather and how you gather suggest maybe that we're thinking about our community too narrowly? The first element of belonging is, begins with presence. And second, increasing presence requires, of course, extending some new invitations. And belonging often begins with a personal invitation. Because when we're not intentional about reaching out personally into the communities that surround our congregations, we inadvertently leave people out. As one pastor reflected, it's not that we deliberately excluded people with disabilities. In fact, we weren't deliberate at all, and that was the problem. You know, many congregations proclaim that they're welcoming. It's all over, emblazoned on their websites, on their church signs, on their outreach materials. But an announcement communicates something altogether different than an invitation. Those are very different things. An invitation is personal, an announcement's not. An invitation says, I'm thinking about you. An announcement leaves open that possibility that there's an asterisk or a footnote or an exception attached to that invitation. And there have been far too many asterisks attached to our proclamations of welcome. For many people with disabilities and their families, those general promises of a warm reception, they've not always been honored. So know that your uh, your announcements about your congregation's hospitality may not resonate with families who have been excluded in the past. And there are more than a few there as well. Uh, we found out that one out of three families have left their congregation because their son or daughter was not welcomed or included. And Bill Gaventa, who shared at conferences I heard once, talked about a panel of families in which one mother counted 13 congregations they'd left, another 17. Third, Families talked about being welcomed. And they weren't talking about what was said, they were talking about what they felt. The host is not the one who determines what is welcoming. It's communicated through personal encounters. And for many of these families, that warm welcome isn't always presumed. You know, attitudes have changed quite a bit, dramatically, I'd say, in decades. But there's still uncertainty that people feel about what to say or how to act, and that pervades our faith communities as well. And we know that when people are uncertain, that uncertainty almost always leads to avoidance. And when people go unacknowledged or overlooked or ignored, they eventually just stop coming. So what does that hospitality look like? I don't have to tell you how to do hospitality well, but certainly it means greeting families when they arrive and introducing them to others, drawing them into conversations, inviting them to other things that happen in and through your congregation. It's those ordinary actions that really send a powerful message that one of the parents described as, we just felt like we were wanted. 
Now, the principal requirement here, of course, is not disability-related expertise or even experience, nor should that kind of welcoming be delegated to your hospitality committee. That's really all of our responsibilities. But there may be times when congregational staff benefit from having a little more confidence about, uh, uh, about uh, guidance on etiquette or language or available congregation resources. Or maybe you have to provide some more specific information about how you welcome someone with complex communication challenges or who behaves in unfamiliar ways or has extensive support needs. A fourth element of belonging that we learned from these families was about being known. Although we're called to welcome the stranger, the stranger's not supposed to remain so for very long. And have you noticed how easy it's becoming in our culture to pass by dozens or hundreds of people week after week on a Sunday or Saturday or whenever you gather and never feel like you're really known? Within our faith communities, people with disabilities are particularly at risk for being known about, but not really being known personally. And that's quite different from just being welcomed. But what we heard from the families, it's not just whether people are known that's an important aspect of belonging, but how people are known that really matters. And so many people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are known first and foremost by their labels rather than by their names. They're known by their deficits uh, rather than by their gifts and their strengths. And the disability service system tends to view people and talk about people in diagnostic terms. But I don't think congregations should adopt that perspective. They should uh, know people in personal and individual ways. If you think about the labels we use in professional circles, and I've put them on the screen, and these are posted online as well, uh, the text of this and descriptions of all of the pictures, you'll see that the labels we use almost always describe people in terms of what they cannot do or what they struggle to do. And so that congregation that says, well, how do we welcome young people with autism in our youth groups? And this is the only image they have of kids with autism. Or the congregation that says, how to be welcoming to individuals with significant intellectual disability, and all they see is significant limitations. Well, that makes for a really hard introduction. So I don't think there's really a place for those kinds of labels in our faith communities. Because in the earlier part of that same project, we listened to families talk about their sons and daughters. And they talked about strengths and gifts and passions and all sorts of things like that. They described their sons and daughters as possessing qualities like kindness and empathy and humor and gratitude, optimism and forgiveness and courage. And those kinds of descriptions provide a really helpful counterpoint to the prevailing descriptions of deficits and struggles and challenges. And they also remind us of the importance of congregations uh, knowing people for their gifts and contributions, not simply their challenges. These parents said they felt like they belong when their children and their families were truly known. I think belonging also uh, involves being accepted. And these families talked about acceptance not coming, really coming through being known, uh, but not generally through an awareness campaign. Not from being known about, but personally known. They talked about their child being welcomed without condition, of being treated like family, of being embraced for who they are. But when we asked parents to share uh, their views about whether their current congregation was accepting of their son or daughter with disabilities, only a little more than half strongly agreed that clergy and congregational leaders accepted their son or daughter. And this is at the churches that they attended. And slightly less than half strongly agreed that congregation members accepted their child. So there is a place for congregations to do these formal awareness activities. Sometimes it's that inclusion awareness Sunday or curricular units as one avenue for fostering acceptance. But we know that really attitudes change through personal contact, through relationships, not through informational campaigns. And what we've learned about the power of that personal contact highlights the importance of minimizing separate and distinctive programming for people with disabilities. Because they inadvertently reinforce those perceptions of difference, but they also limit the opportunities for people to ever encounter one another in our congregations and meet in personal ways. And what is communicated from the pulpit will also matter and create this cultural of accept, culture of acceptance. It's that pastor who's completely unfazed when someone answers aloud uh, her rhetorical questions in the sermon. It's that pastor who declares the entire sanctuary a no shush zone. Uh, it's that pastor who, instead of making noisy people go to the cry room, has only people who can worship in complete silence go to the cry room. <laughs> it's. And that's from Mark Stevenson. <laughs> 
It's the one who recognized that mastering this week's sermon is not the entry ticket to next week's sermon. And it's the one who's willing to do things in slightly different ways if it means bringing one more person into community. Six, the families we spoke with talked about the supports that their sons or daughters needed. Now, most congregations already take steps to support people who are part of their congregation, whether that's through child care or helping with transportation, connecting families to small groups, assisting financially. Those ordinary supports are also important for people with disabilities and their families. But at the same time, the supports we provide may need to be more intentional or individualized or even uh, more um, intense for some individuals who are part of our congregation. But this is not a place, family said, for making presumptions but rather to invite input. We found that almost half of families of children with intellectual and developmental disabilities say they had never ever been asked by anyone at their congregation what the best way was to include their child in religious activities. So simply asking those good questions is really a good starting point. And I don't know what their responses will be. Uh, we'll talk this afternoon about what we've learned from our studies of 500 families about the supports that would be helpful to them. And we've put links online to a guide you can download if you want to learn about what families in general say might be helpful. But know that every family is different. And it begins with asking, what would it look like to make Sunday or Saturday the best day of the week for your son or daughter, not for a category of people? Seventh. Healthy faith communities are marked by deep care for one another. They recognize and they strive to support the spiritual and the emotional and the practical needs of their members. And that care communicates to families that they matter, that they belong. In one of our studies, actually, one of the strongest predictors of family quality of life of individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities was their connections to a faith community, their involvement, stronger than almost any other predictor, including access to service systems. So, I think that's a really important piece, but these families also talked about the importance not only of those general supports, but very specific supports that might be related to disability that would really help their family. That was ministry to people with disabilities for these families. And it turns out there's no shortage of congregations who can play a role in helping members with disabilities thrive. I've put on the screen literally four churches on a corner, a street corner. There are 335,000 congregations across the country, and those of you who live in western Michigan know almost all of them are here, <laughs> right? Well, except for the ones in Nashville, which I've put on the screen a screenshot of Nashville, and every dot, red dot, is a congregation in Nashville, and it looks like it has chicken pox, doesn't it? <laughs> Think about the collective impact faith communities could have. The poverty rate for people with intellectual disabilities is twice what it is for people without disabilities. The employment rate for people with intellectual disabilities is 10%. That's not the unemployment rate. It's the employment rate. Inadequate housing options abound. Twice as many people with disabilities don't have access to reliable transportation. These are all places where people can be cared for and ministered to and real needs be addressed by congregations. And families said they would be very open to those kinds of supports as well. But there's a word of caution that goes with this. The history of disability is replete with examples of well-intentioned care being used in wounding ways. And what feels like care for one person might feel like a paternalism for another person. So we want to make sure, like in all areas, we're not beginning with presumptions, but finding out firsthand what individual families might want. And eighth, we're made for relationships. The companionship and the intimacy, the reciprocity and support that come from friendships are vital to all of our own thriving. And all of the other dimensions I've mentioned so far can be done in the absence of a close and personal relationship. They can be done at arm's length, but friendship takes belonging deeper. And yet the friendships that are so fundamental to our own flourishing are so elusive for children and young adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. One study found that adolescents with autism, half had not been invited to another person's, another peer's event in the entire prior year, half. And more than one quarter of adults with intellectual and developmental dis disabilities who are receiving supports in our public service system have no friendships uh, or caring relationships beyond their family or the people who are paid to be part of their lives. So I think this really, as we heard from families, highlights the importance of what takes place between Sundays. 
about life lived together beyond the walls of our congregation. That's what pushes people away from just acquaintances and toward close friendships. Whether that's sharing a cup of coffee, taking a stroll through a park, watching the big game together, joining the same small group. Those are the ordinary gestures that can take place for people that rarely happen outside of our service systems. And once again, it's a place that requires no special training to be able to do. And ninth, the individuals and families that we spoke with came to feel needed uh, when others in the congregation saw them as bringing gifts and talents that benefited the entire community, that made the community itself thrive. That is ministry by people with disabilities, and it reflects a recognition that they, like everyone else, are indispensable members of the body. You know, as relationships deepen, people come to see their need for one another. And for many of the individuals and families that we spoke with, that authentic belonging really was marked by a real reciprocity, where each person brings to and receives from that relationship. I think more and more ministries are investing in ministry to people with disabilities, and that's an important area to invest in, but many are struggling to move to the place of ministry by people with disabilities. People with intellectual disabilities are still seen as the designated recipients of service and outreach, and those roles of giver and receiver are far too static and predetermined. And certainly people with disabilities will benefit from what a faith community has to offer, but it's also true in the story we probably need to tell that faith communities have much to gain by encountering the faith and the friendship and the gifts of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I think that's why I love this church sign so much. Uh, I stopped uh, by to take this picture. I was on the way to my child's school a couple years ago, and I think it's the posture these families wish every congregation would adopt as they think about their community. It says, read 1 Corinthians 12, we need you here ASAP. I think when we think about the conversations here, it, it, it really suggests that faith communities are incomplete without the presence and participation of people with disabilities. And when we're convinced that that's true, when we're really convinced that's true, we no longer think of inclusion as something that's nice to do because it's good for someone else. We see it as something that actually strengthens our community. We're no longer satisfied to wait until people show up to welcome them. We start going into our communities and pursuing people with personal invitations. We move beyond trying to tinker and retrofit our congregations to make them work, and we start designing what we do at the outset with a broader sense of our community in mind. And we also make people with disabilities and their families, not an afterthought, but a real forethought as we think about all that we do. And finally, the tenth dimension that they mentioned uh, is love. And lest you worry that a social scientist is about to lecture on love, never fear. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. So I don't have to explain what love has to do with belonging. Uh, many of you are familiar with the writings of Wolf Wolfensberger, who is a real pioneer in our field. He offered the observation that healing for wounded people with disabilities begins with three messages, that you are valuable, that you are as valuable as any other person, and that you are loved by those around you. So belonging, simple, right, but also so complex. And while I ordered those 10 dimensions in a way that really do imply this deepening progression, it's not a hierarchy. Each one has special importance to these families, and each is linked to every other dimension. For example, being present and welcomed and known, uh, that is the foundation for future relationships that uh, you might have with others. But each on its own isn't sufficient for belonging. Likewise, it's hard to be befriended and needed and loved if you're not present or you're known by others in your community. So where does that leave us? Well, I hope you will agree that what these families and individuals shared seem to shatter some of the myths that I think are so widely held, whether they're spoken or just implied in our actions. So I'm going to leave you with four of those myths I hope these shatter. First, of course, is that uh, these dimensions of belonging seem to me to reflect ordinary needs, far more than special needs, don't they? Conversations about disability ministry so often accentuate the new or distinct efforts congregations should undertake to support the presence and participation of people with disabilities. But the themes from these families strike me as relevant to supporting the belonging of anyone. Their familiarity and their broad resonance maybe offer a reminder that the deepest needs of people with intellectual disabilities and their families aren't special at all, but really quite universal. The difference may be in the intentionality that we need to apply as we seek to meet those needs. So maybe we need more universal needs ministries than special needs ministries. And second, a myth I've actually never heard spoken, 
but seems so reflected in our practice that people need programs more than relationships, right? Because the initial inclination of so many congregations is to start a new ministry program or some other specialized experience. And I think in many ways they're mirroring what we see in broader culture and the broader society as we specialize our employment and our educational and our residential settings. And these are often segregated and distinct efforts that stand apart from every other congregational activity. But that means that opportunities to be welcomed and known and befriended and needed become inadvertently limited. So when we prioritize relationships, we only then do formal programming when it enhances belonging and we abandon it when it doesn't. And third, myth three, is that you need some sort of special training or advanced degree to promote the kinds of belonging that we've talked about and heard from these families. Not so, the markers identified by these families are well within the capacity of any congregation. And finally, I know what you're thinking. I hear you, this really sounds like this ought to be something that faith communities are invested in, but you know, we're just not sensing a call on our congregation, right? And besides, there's lots of other congregations that are doing disability ministry pretty well. Maybe we could just kind of have a ministry of referral here. Would that be all right, right? <laughs> so that's myth four, that someone else should be definitely investing here. Actually, that's not a myth. Someone else should be investing, but so should you, right? Uh, that someone else includes uh, you as well. So I hope what we've learned from these families provides a helpful points of reflection for congregations that really are desiring to be a place of hospitality where people with disabilities in their families, indeed everyone, can really feel like they belong. So how might the attitudes and the actions of your congregation members and its leaders aim towards each of those aspects of belonging? What would be the steps that you would take to become places where all families and their members are welcomed and accepted, cared for, known, befriended, needed, and loved. Well, you're in the right place today and throughout this week because as you listen to the conversations all throughout this conference, start listening closely for those next steps that you might take, for the practices you might pursue, for the stories you might share, and the people with whom you partner as you strive to become a community that's marked by belonging for all of your members including people with disabilities and their families. Thank you. Mm -hmm.